as we study the scriptures, we like to work our way through books of the Bible, and so we've been doing that for six years, except that maybe the last year we've just been taking some familiar passages and breaking them down and reworking them and exposing some of what maybe we didn't realize might be hidden in the text. So we did that this time last year. We worked our way through the Lord's Prayer. How many of you remember that? I don't know. I can't really see hands, but do you guys remember the Lord's Prayer? If you weren't here this time last year, I would encourage you to go back to the Lord's Prayer series on our website, um, just either on our app or on our website. Go back and look for the Lord's Prayer and just work your way through that series if you're looking for things to listen to. Uh, Because a lot of what, what we learned back in that series is actually connected thematically to what we're going to study in this series that we're going to cover in the next eight or so weeks. So we're going to begin a study on the Beatitudes. We did the Lord's Prayer, then we did Psalm 23 and broke that down, then we did some parables of Jesus and we broke those down, and now we're looking at the Beatitudes, and some of you may know what those are and some of you may not, and so I'll give an introduction today um, to the Beatitudes, so I'll, I'll explain more about what they are. But the Beatitudes are a section of a message or a sermon that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 5 all the way through Matthew chapter 7. So there's, there's uh, three chapters there where Jesus is, is preaching a sermon. It's the first one that Matthew Matthew sort of records and assembles for us of the messages that that Matthew gives us in his book. And so as Jesus begins his ministry in one of his most public sermons, which also is arguably maybe the most famous sermon of Jesus, it begins with these beatitudes, but halfway through this sermon, and as we look at the the message that Jesus gives from chapter 5 to chapter 7, halfway through is the Lord's Prayer that we studied this time last year. And so it's all part of the same message. It's all part of the same theme that Jesus, or there's a few working themes in this message, but it's all connected to what we learned even last year at, at, at this time. And so when we studied the Lord's Prayer, one of the things we, if you'll remember, is that we talked about how we, when Jesus showed us how to pray, he wasn't just telling us what the, what the uh, secret password was to be able to get all of our prayers answered or to be able to pray the right way. He was more or less teaching us what kinds of people we should be when we pray. And so as he taught us to pray, he was teaching us what kinds of people we should be. And I think when we study the Beatitudes, there's a tendency, too, to read the Beatitudes where they say something like, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, sort of as a, a, a way of just seeing uh, that God would, would bless us for the things we do by comforting us. And I want us to see that actually when Jesus begins these Beatitudes, he's talking less about sort of what you need to do to please God or to be comforted by God, and more about the kinds of people that inhabit his kingdom. In other words, it's like having a crowd of people, like, like maybe, let's just imagine, a crowd of people uh, much larger than our size, and they're wondering what kind of king this is as Jesus sits on the mountain to teach this sermon. It's sort of um, picturesque. It, it, it reminds us of Moses going up into the mountain and sort of teaching the people, those kinds of, those kinds of themes. So there's more here than we'll unpack today, but it's worth at least mentioning that Jesus going up onto the mountainside to teach his disciples and then the, the crowds there listening, um, really it's, it's like a king telling these people that are listening what his kingdom is like and what the people are like from that kingdom. That's what the Beatitudes are like. They're more descriptive. And and as we study these Beatitudes, I want us to read this passage and talk a little bit about um, the word Beatitude and the word blessed or blessed, as you'll see it with us. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read all the way through verse 16. I want you to see the whole context, and then over the next eight weeks, we're going to break it down into its parts. Here in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 1, we are in the, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so, or in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out into the streets and to be trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, and nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house, and in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> As we study this passage, the first thing that I, I want to talk about, and maybe all I can get to today, is just that word, blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those... The, that are meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. A New Testament scholar, um, Scott, Scott McKnight, actually says, on this one word, the word blessed, the entire passage stands, and from this one word, the whole list of these Beatitudes hangs. In other words, if we get this word right, then, then the rest of it makes sense. And if we miss the meaning of this word, then it, we may actually miss uh, the, the thrust of, of the message here by Jesus. Now, just to explain this word a little bit, it's a, it's a um, Greek word here that has a parallel word in the Old Testament, too. It's a word that doesn't, there, there's, a, there's two kinds of Greek words or even two kinds of Hebrew words that can be translated blessed. Um, one of them is not the word here. One of them is the notion of sort of being, being blessed by someone uh, or, or, being, uh, or, or, or a blessing that is pronounced upon you. In other words, it, it's different than saying, um, God blessed me with, you know, this gift that he gave me. Or it's even different than in the scriptures where we see um, the psalmist or others saying, bless the Lord. In other words, give thanks to the Lord or praise the Lord. That is a different Hebrew word. And even the notion of a priest or someone in the scriptures blessing someone else, this, this is a different Greek word too. When we look at this word in the Greek and, and when we look at its corresponding word in the Hebrew, it actually refers less to sort of a pronouncement of a blessing or the gift of a blessing or blessing you with something and more to a state of being. In other words, there's a state of being that is what you might call blessedness or um, believe it or not, uh, a word that, that I love and we have been using for a few years now is, is actually a very appropriate translation for this word blessed. Um, and it would be flourishing. They are living in a state of blessedness. They are experiencing flourishing. Do you know another way to put this, which would, I guess, make sense to us, and maybe even make sense to our culture at large, would be Jesus is saying, or describing, who is living the good life. Now, when you think of it that way, this is kind of an odd passage. It's kind of an odd way, not just for Jesus to open his first message, but even just the content now of what Jesus is saying seems a bit odd. In other words, if he's talking about being favored by God and being, flour and being in a state of flourishing under God's care, this has the essence of not just having his approval, not just receiving the blessing of God, which I think is an element of it. It's just not the total meaning of this word. It, it also talks about the life or describes the kind of life one is experiencing when he's believing in God's promises. In other words, Jesus is saying, they are experiencing God's favor and experiencing a flourishing life. They are living the good life, those who mourn, because they will be comforted. Well, now that reads a little differently when we put it that way. I think the, there's a passage that, that makes um, sense for us when we look at Psalm chapter 1 and we see how the word blessed is used there. So would you turn over to Psalm 1 or just follow along with me as we read in Psalm 1. I want you to see how the word blessed is used and I want you to see that this is the way that Jesus is using the word blessed when we read about it in, in, the, in the Beatitudes. So in Psalm 1, or the first psalm of the Psalms, 
It says this, <clears throat> blessed is the man. Now remember, we're not talking about like the, the man who does all the right things receives all the good blessings. That's not what we're talking about. His life is flourishing. He is living the good life, the one who does what we're reading. So see it that way. His life is flourishing, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And here's the picture of the flourishing. Verse 3, he is like a tree. This is his flourishing condition. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. They are basically not flourishing. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. The way that I read that last verse, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish, um, is that it's really a parallel statement. What it's saying is not just that the Lord knows what you're doing, um, it's, it's in contrast to the way of the wicked shall perish. The, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He's familiar with it, intimately familiar with it, like Adam knew Eve and they conceived and had a son kind of familiarity with, with knowing the way of the righteous. In other words, the way of the righteous is where we find God himself. When you read the Beatitudes that way, though, and if we go back to that, we would say, well, so then what kind of Savior do we have and what kind of people inhabit his kingdom? It's a Savior who is meek. It's a Savior who understands how to mourn, why to mourn. It's a Savior who is a peacemaker. It's a Savior who is poor in spirit. It's a Savior who is hunger, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. This is the way of our Savior. It's the way of the kingdom. It's the way of all of his followers. And I think just as I mentioned earlier about, about the, the word blessed or, or, or flourishing, this word really describes a state of being. If you'll remember the, the, the study on our Lord's Prayer that, we, that I mentioned earlier, we're not really asking, again, like with prayer, what kind of prayer we should pray so that we have better access to God. Jesus is teaching what kinds of people we should be when we pray. And the same is true here. Jesus isn't saying, hey, if you want a blessing, mourn, and then God will come for you. Hey, if you want to inhabit the earth, try really hard to be meek, and then God will give it to you. It's not really sort of telling us what to do as much as describing what kind of people we should be, what kind of people we are if we are the children of God. So each week as we study this, I think we're going we're gonna to dig down into this, each one of those phrases, and really discover what kinds of people are they who mourn? What kinds of people are they who are meek? What kinds of people are they who seek peace or are peacemakers? And as we dig into this, I think what we're going to find is probably that it's, it's different or at least runs against the grain of just human nature or at least our fallen sinful nature. That's what makes this message of Jesus so um, controversial. And if you think about it too, when we look at the, the, the context of Jesus and his disciples and then all the crowd that's listening, he's teaching his disciples and the crowd is overlooking or listening, that at that time, some 2,000 years ago, these people would have, been, would have at least considered themselves to be oppressed by the Romans. They were living under Roman rule. They, they did not appreciate the Roman rule and, and so felt, in some cases, like with the zealots, they actually wanted to overthrow Roman rule in their lives or in their kingdom. They were expecting a Messiah who would come and overthrow the, the Roman rule, a Messiah who would come and set things right and make Israel great again, a Messiah who would come and, <clears throat> and really... Uh, bring this kind of almost maybe political or national hope to Israel. But when Jesus came, didn't he just sort of upend all that? Wasn't it a bit confusing for even his disciples as they watch the way Jesus operates, they listen to his teaching, and then they just sort of see a downward decline in his ministry to the point of death? I think it's very confusing for them. This is not what they assumed the Messiah would come and do. It's 
frankly, not what anyone in the crowd thought that the Messiah would do. Something you would expect from a Messiah, a, a political and national Messiah, a king, a ruler, would be something akin to what the, room, the Romans would be saying, which is blessed, or the good life are those who are rich. The good life really belongs to those who are powerful. The good life really belongs to those who will not stand uh, silent in the face of oppression, but will stand up and overthrow their oppressors. The good life are the ones who, and you, you fill in the blanks. In fact, let's just transport from 2,000 years ago to today, and let me ask you, what in your mind represents the good life? I can bet that unless you've been studying the Beatitudes for the last few months like I have, you probably didn't imagine mourning or meekness, power that is subdued, a humility. This is what I think is so controversial about the message of Jesus. There's even a point later in this very same message where he says, if a Roman centurion says, here, you take my bags, one of your oppressors says, here, you take my bags and you carry them for me this mile, they were obligated to do so. Jesus says, take it, take it two miles. This would have been repulsive. This would have been controversial. And in Jesus' message, I think that's what we need to feel as we study this. Like, wait, why, why is the good life, why does it belong to those who mourn? Why is the good life something that belongs to those who are poor? Those who are poor in spirit. But even Luke, as Luke recounts this message, he says, blessed are the poor. It's just not what we would think. And I think a way to put it, I, I don't know that I'd stand by this definition, but a way to put it that might jar us a little bit is Jesus is giving us an indication of the kinds of people that God sides with, the, guy, the kinds of people that God, in a way, aligns himself with, or at least the kinds of people that God himself came to be. I think when we study this, what we're realizing is that <clears throat> the way of Christ is differently than maybe we've come to see um, our way of life. The, 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 the way of the kingdom is maybe differently than we've realized. And, and part of that is because I think we just see not only our relationship with others, but even our relationship with God to be transactional. In, in, in my estimation, because we've translated this passage in English, the, translated the word makarios, which is the Greek, nobody needed to know that, but because we've translated that word into English as blessed are those who, and because it's worded this way, I don't think we get the fullest picture of what Jesus is saying, and I think it possibly reinforces the notion that our relationship with God is, is transactional. In other words, if I do these things, then God will bless me. And, and unfortunately, that is the way that is counter to the good news of Jesus. In fact, it's what in the scriptures would be referred to as man-made religion or the wisdom of this world. It's, it's seeing God through a lens that is transactional. If I'm good, he blesses me. If I disobey or if I'm bad in some way, well, then I'll you know, definitely feel the, the weight of his wrath and disappointment. And the gospel is different than that. And here in these Beatitudes, I think what we need to see is basically a way of, of not just reinterpreting, but maybe retranslating these Beatitudes. Every week I'm going to come to you, we're going to read the translation that we have in our Bibles, but I want to give you a translation that I think more fully captures the word blessed are those who are meek or those who mourn. You know, it's kind of like, uh, and maybe you're wondering, like, well, no, isn't, don't we want a word-for-word -word translation? Don't we want, like, what is that English word for the Greek word in there? What's the best one-to-one -one parallel? And it's, sometimes it's just not always there. Uh, we see this today, too. For instance, there is a Spanish word called deja vu. Just kidding. I know it's not Spanish. Um, <clears throat> but when you think of the word deja vu, can you think of one English word that best captures the whole concept? I hope no one has that word. I couldn't think of it, so I'd be embarrassed to be like, well, that's a bad example. I really can't. It's like when someone says, oh, man, it's like deja vu. What, what they mean is like a half of a paragraph of sentences. What they mean is like, well, it's weird because I know I've never been here, but being here now makes me feel like this place is familiar. It, it almost feels like I've been here before. Right. What's that English word? I don't know. So let's use, let's use the... Uh, 
Portuguese. What is it? It's French. I know it's French. I'm just messing with you guys. Let's use the French one word, or at least it's two words, but let's use the French word for this because that one word captures sort of a lengthy English description for it because we don't have a word for that. That's kind of like what this word makarios is like in the Greek. It's a word that that doesn't really have a one-to-one correlation. I feel like flourishing or the good life is almost uh, as good, if not better, than just the word blessed because I think it conveys more of what that word means. And I think for us, when we look at these Beatitudes, when we realize that they're not transactional like that, these Beatitudes are more transformational. What I mean is they don't necessarily tell us how to get a blessing from God. They describe the kinds of people who are flourishing under God's care or in his blessing. I think these Beatitudes, these words of flourishing, actually describe the change you experience when you believe his promises. And I think that's what Jesus is describing later in the book of Matthew when he talks about the abundant life. We could just use that teaching when Jesus talks about, I want you to have life and to have it more abundantly. He's talking about these beatitudes. I want you to experience the abundant life. And we would be sitting at his feet going, yes, yes, and yes. All the prosperity, all the good things, all the things I'm imagining when you say the good life. Yes, Lord. And then he gives us the beatitudes, which is like, so good then. Then blessed are those who mourn. The good life is for those who are, are or is being experienced by those who mourn. The good life would be a way of peacemaking. The good life would be a way of, of, of being meek and humble. And I think this is the essence of this message. So hopefully that's clear, a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overview of just that term. And when we read this passage, I think what we have to do is actually ask ourselves, are we like the, this person Jesus is describing? Each week as we look at one, one after the other, I think we have to ask ourselves, are we like these people? And not just are we like them. In other words, are we ones who can mourn with the freedom to mourn because we have the promise and hope of his comfort, but also with the freedom to comfort others who mourn because we have the promise of his comfort, and so do they if they would believe it. So I guess what I'm saying is for us as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, am I like one of those kinds of people? Am I like this? Is this a characteristic or a trait in my own life? And where do I need to repent and believe the good news of Jesus? That's what we'll be looking at each week as we study this passage. I think when we, when we come to Jesus, just like the crowds and even the disciples, remember when I said that they kind of misunderstood the Messiah. They had this hope or this expectation that the king would come and that he would overthrow Roman oppression and that he would set things right and that Israel would rise again to power and be just a, a global nation of power and recognition. And I think what happens here when, when we approach Jesus is very much like what happened to the disciples and even to the crowds that came to listen to him. We come to him with our expectations. We come to him with our own agenda, and we expect or at least hope that he'll make good on, on, on what we're expecting or make good on the agenda we've set for him. The, you, you see this in the life of the disciples because they even begin to sort of talk amongst themselves about who's going to rule and reign with Jesus, who's going to sit at his right hand, who's going to sit at his left hand. They have this agenda as they're following Jesus, like, hey, here's a guy we should get on board with. Here's sort of a bandwagon we should try to jump onto. Now, I don't want to completely, um, uh, I guess, disregard the sincerity that the disciples had in following Jesus. I just think they might have been misunderstood, and we see glimpses of them misunderstanding Jesus because they've come to him with their own agenda. At one point, they're even asking sort of who will be the greatest in the kingdom. And of course, Jesus clarifies that for them. But I think the crowds even come to Jesus with their own expectations and their own agenda. Many times they're coming to him just to be fed. Many times they're coming to him just to be healed. And so I think when we come to Jesus, many of us are coming with the same kind of either agenda or expectation of Jesus. And and I think we don't always realize it. The Beatitudes are a real gut check for us. I think think that's what we're going to experience here. And not only that we have sort of a a tendency to have expectations or our own agendas when we come to God that we don't even realize, particularly as religious people or or church-going folk, but I think we also have a tendency, I think everyone does, to sort of pick and choose which parts of Jesus 
his person and his message that we prefer or that we would, we would rather follow than maybe some of the other parts that we prefer more or less. When, when I say it that way, I think the Beatitudes don't let us do that. All of them, in my estimation, are contrary to our broken view of the world, and they, they seek to set things right by showing us what kinds of people we should be. They, 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 they are contrary to the broken ways of relating to each other. And I think the Beatitudes have a way of setting those right. Remember, again, the Beatitudes are not transactional, sort of outlining the blessings we get if we have good behavior, but they're more transformational, describing the kind of life we experience when we receive and enjoy his blessings. And, and hidden in these Beatitudes or these descriptions of the one who flourishes, the good life, are really two things. One is the way of living or relating to others in God's kingdom. In other words, Jesus is saying, well, where I come from, this is how those people are. When I save you, when you become one of God's children, this is who I'm making you to be. This is sort of what you would aspire to, but this is also the work I'm doing in your life to, to, um, to make you a, a citizen of my kingdom, to, to make you a, a better reflection of my kingdom. And this would be sort of a progressive growth in our own lives. Because on the one hand, when God saves us, when we become his child, we are already seated in heavenly places. We are already citizens of the kingdom. But on the other hand, can't many of us agree that our lives in some ways don't always reflect the character and nature of those who belong to that kingdom? Well, this is the work of progress that God is doing in our lives so that over time in various areas of our lives, the good news of Jesus is setting us free so that, so that over time we are becoming more like the people described here in the Beatitudes. I wouldn't be surprised that if, as we work through the Beatitudes for every harsh thing we have to say about our hypocrisy, there are some good things to say about the way that we operate and that for some of us who've been Christians for a while or even new Christians, you're beginning to get a sense for um, the humility and the meekness, the the mourning and, the, and the, the comfort of those who mourn, you're beginning to feel that, and, and there's some resonation there. In other words, there's, there's some good here, too, that we can celebrate in terms of the work that God's doing in our lives to make us more like his kingdom, more like the citizens of his kingdom that we already are, that we are becoming. So the first is, I think when we look at these Beatitudes, we're seeing a way of life. But the second thing is that we see in the second half of each of these verses is a promise that makes that kind of living possible. And here's where I think we rise above sort of the transactional nature of, of the way we might just initially read these verses at first glance. And in this way, I think the, the Beatitudes are more gospel-centered. Can I use that word? I'll explain what I mean. In this way, I think the Beatitudes are more gospel-centered than maybe we've understood them. Just at a first read. The reason I say that is because gospel-centered really is what, at least what I mean when I think of, say, like teaching or preaching that is gospel-centered. I don't necessarily mean something that is evangelistic. So growing up in the uh, culture uh, that I grew up in, in the church culture I grew up in, when someone was referred to as like, man, he preaches the gospel, what that meant was he's an evangelist. In other words, he preaches the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and he's more or less convincing when he talks about the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and people sort of get saved or they are converted or they come to faith in Christ. What I want you to see when, when we talk about the word gospel or at least gospel-centered is that I think it goes, it includes that, but it goes beyond that to address our motives and to address sort of the deeper heart-level transformation for the rest of our lives in every other area of our lives. What I mean here is that if I were to get up and to say, you should love your neighbor— if I, if I don't actually share with you the motive for loving your neighbor, then I actually leave too much for you to assume about what a right motive would be. It's not that I don't trust you. I'm just sharing what gospel-centered preaching looks like. What that means is that for some of us, if I say you should love your neighbor, some of us would walk away with, with fear in our hearts, feeling like if I don't, maybe God will punish me. So I better do it. If I don't explain a gospel-centered motive for obedience, some of us walk away with pride or self-righteousness saying, I do love my neighbor, and I'm glad. I'm good with this one. Kind of like the rich young ruler is like, yep, all these things I've done from my youth up. 
If we don't give a, if we don't preach in a way that is gospel-centered when we address not just salvation in the first place, but the transformation at the heart level in every other area of our lives, if we don't use the gospel to address that, I think we leave too many other motives unchecked. Fear, self-righteousness that I just mentioned, pri- uh, uh, pride, and um, guilt. Some of us might be motivated by guilt to do the right thing, and even shame. Some of us feel shame and then try to make up for it by sort of overcompensating. Um, We do that in our relationships with others when we feel shame. We do that in our relationship with God sometimes too when we feel shame or guilt. Sort of overcompensate, add a few extra dollars to the tithe check, you know, show up at everything that we can, um, try, to, try to at least give, you know, a better impression of ourselves with others. We just overcompensate sometimes when we've got that wrong motive. Now the reason I say that is because here in the Beatitudes, if we read them just a little bit differently, I want you to see that the Beatitudes contain promises that are motive-based for this way of living that he's talking about. In other words, like, let's just take the, 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 the let's take the second one there in, in verse 4. So chapter 5, verse 4. Um, <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The way I would read this is something more like their lives are flourishing. They are experiencing the good life, those who mourn, because they expect and are experiencing God's comfort. In other words, the way we read it when it's transactional is like, if we mourn, then we're comforted. Whereas the way it reads now when I change it like that, isn't it different? It's the other way around. We are living the good life when we mourn because of something that's happening to us. Because we realize and believe in the comfort of God. There's a promise here for us that all those who belong to God as his children will be comforted. We are comforted now, but we will be comforted with an eternal comfort when he comes to establish his eternal kingdom. This fundamental belief frees us to be the kinds of kingdom people who rightly mourn the right things. We'll talk more about that when we get to this verse, but that's what I want you to see. There's a hidden promise here. It's not transactional. Jesus is telling us what is transformational in the lives of these believers. And it's always the second half of these verses. These are the promises. These are the gospel-centered promises of Jesus, the motive-based, heart-level transforming uh, parts of the Beatitudes that really shape the first part of everything we read in these verses. And that's why I think it's important for us to see that. This way of being gospel-centered really is the way of Christ, and it's the way that he is is changing us, and these are the kinds of people that we are becoming. In other words, I don't think you can truly be awakened to God's mercy and even receive God's mercy and not be merciful to others. Not being merciful to others in some area of our life would be an indication that we hadn't applied the good news of having received God's mercy in that area of our life. So in some ways, like maybe on the job, maybe you're a merciful sort of coworker or something like that, but maybe in the home, not so much. In other words, I don't, I don't necessarily mean that in every way you, we are unmerciful, but what I mean is that as we're growing, we'll discover, hey, I'm actually trending towards unmercy, not mercy in this category. So what do I need to do? Well, fear, guilt, pride, or shame, but let's apply some motive because it needs to change. No, 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 no. We go back to the beatitude. What is the good life for those who are merciful? Well, these are the ones who have received mercy. So we go back to the good news. We actually learn about the mercy of God. It begins to have a heart-level transforming work in our lives, and that begins to see its effect in these other areas of our lives. That's how these Beatitudes work. That's how they're meant to work. And I think for us, the reason I'm pointing that out is because it's too easy for us, not just to assume a different motive, but too easy for us to remain in a transactional way of of relating to God. And I would encourage us today and over the next several weeks to really evaluate whether or not you've been relating to God in a way that really is transactional, whether you wanted to or not. This really isn't sort of about guilt or shame. This is about us finding a life that's flourishing, 
right? If I could show you something that was wrong and then say, hey, if we fix this, you're on the path to flourishing, why wouldn't you say, yeah, actually, I want to turn from that and I want to embrace this other reality. I want to embrace what's actually true. I want to believe what's actually true and I want to see that kind of transformation. So when the preacher says, if it's me or someone else, guys, this is the truth and we need to repent and believe that truth, it's the way to flourishing. So, so children of God would embrace that correction. When I'm studying the scriptures, I'm confronted with that and I feel that weight, you know, when I want to push up against what Jesus is saying. The children of God will embrace this correction. The children of God will see it as the way to flourishing. It's almost like a, a, a secret passageway in a big house. If I, I, I don't imagine ever having millions of dollars, but if I had millions and I had some kind of million dollar house or something, it has to come with a secret passageway, okay? It just has to. That's like what I'm going to share with the realtor. If we were on like HGTV and it was one of our three things we're looking for, one of them would be a secret passageway. It's just the way it is. When Jesus shares with us the gospel of Jesus, uh, the, the good news of his kingdom, I should say, he's really indicating something of like a hidden passageway. When he says all of these, these paradoxical statements, like the way to life is through death, well, you wouldn't think that. The way to human flourishing, the way to the good life is to be humble and to be a peacemaker, to side with those who mourn, to listen to them, to fight their cause. This, for me, I think is, is why it's, it's sort of, a, a, I guess, a secret passageway, for lack of a better way to put it. And what Jesus does in his good news, and what we learn in this gospel here as we read, the, read through the Beatitudes, is the, the, the reality of, a, of, of I guess, an a alternate reality that we can't see. This would be the nature of faith. It's not a blind faith. It's not just making something up and then choosing to believe it. It's actually believing what the scriptures teach are true, is true, even though we can't see it. So in other words, it is grounded in something the Bible says is true. We're not making this up. It's just that we can't actually see it. We don't actually experience it, right? So that would be in our circumstances where we don't feel loved. We kind of feel left out, but the scriptures say that we are loved. So we're not making that up. We're actually just choosing to take a step of faith that's not blind, that actually is choosing to believe that what the Scriptures teach is true, contrary to what I'm experiencing, maybe even contrary to what I'm feeling right now. This is faith. This, as we study this kind of faith, is, is when even at times where, where God is saying to us through the Beatitudes, through His Holy Spirit, this is the way of flourishing. Turn, turn, change your view, change your perspective. Open yourself to me and let me do my work in your heart. Begin to see things differently. Soften your heart towards others. Soften your heart to the good news. Don't be stiff-necked like the way Jesus describes the Pharisees. But change and follow me. When we do that, we're embracing a reality Jesus describes that we can't always see, and that's faith. That's walking by faith. There's a, a, a book um, called Here and Now, and a quote from this book is, it, it says that joy <clears throat> does not come from positive predictions about the state of the world. It does not depend on the ups <clears throat> and downs of the circumstances of our lives. Joy is based on the spiritual knowledge that while the world in which we live is shrouded in darkness, God has already overcome the world, and Jesus says it loud and clearly. In the world you will have troubles, but rejoice, be flourishing, because I've overcome the world. You see, the surprise here, continuing the quote, the surprise is not that unexpectedly things turn out better than expected. No, the real surprise is that God's light is more real than all the darkness we experience. That's faith. It's that God's truth is more powerful than all human lies. That's faith. It's that God's love is stronger than death. And it takes faith to believe that. When we do this, I think we're living in a way that really does embrace the hidden message here of the Beatitudes, which is the way to flourishing, the transformation that leads us to flourishing. When we stay in our transactional mode, I think when we're not countered by the gospel, we just stay in our way of relating to God that is not healthy. And, and just, to, just to give you part of this overview, there is a corresponding set of woes 
to these Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 23. Will you just, just look on the screen? If you want to turn there, you can. If you're taking notes, be sure to go and read these later. I want you to actually see that there's a corresponding set of eight to the eight Beatitudes, a corresponding set of woes. Look at verse um, 13 of chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 13. This is in the ESV again. But woe to you, this is woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You neither enter in yourselves, nor allow those who would enter to go in. He says in verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. These are missionaries, guys. These are like church planters, guys. And he says, Woe to you. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell to yourself, th than yourselves. Look at verse 23. Just skip down to verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, all of your little herbs you tithe, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness. That one happens to correspond with the one that says, blessed are those who are merciful, um, for they will receive mercy. You see, what Jesus is saying here is that if you continue to view God, and this is what Matthew is teaching us about the message of Jesus, if you continue to view your relationship with God as transactional, you're on a path to not flourishing. In fact, if you would take the, the NLT, which is the version I love to preach from, and it's my favorite version to read from, you don't have to open one if you don't have one. I just want to show it to you on the screen. In the NLT, when you get over to Matthew chapter 23, I think it's a better translation, whereas I think it's a, not a good translation in the Beatitudes. I think it's a better translation here in these woes when we read it in verse 13. So Matthew 23, 13 in the ESV says, What sorrow awaits, woe to you teachers and Pharisees. What sorrow awaits you. In other words, what lack of flourishing you are experiencing. I only wish that the Beatitudes had that same um, sort of translation effect. What great joy awaits those who mourn. What great joy awaits those who are meek. What great joy awaits those who are persecuted because they are peacemakers. And if our hearts aren't changed, if we aren't countered by the good news of Jesus Christ, like Newton's uh, first law of motion, where things remain at rest or continue to move unless countered by a, a force that either moves them or is contrary and opposing. Sorry. Um, that, that, it's kind of like that. We just sort of stay in this transactional relationship with God until it just grows and grows and grows to a point where we are not flourishing in our relationship with Him anymore. We're actually becoming burdened by our relationship with Him. We're burdened by all the do's and don'ts in the scriptures. We're burdened and not flourishing. And this would be, I think, the way Jesus is saying, woe to those of you pursuing religion without allowing the gospel to change your hearts. That's my hope for us, that we would listen. I have so many other things I want to share, but I think this is necessary for us in our time and, and, and in, our, in our era. I think some of the things we're seeing in our culture, um, even around us, maybe not just politically, but even socially, um, all of these kinds of things that we're feeling and sensing are sort of the result of just a mix of factors. And, and I think maybe, maybe, for example, one of them is just sort of the natural result of, of a culture that embraces moral relativism. Sort of, you can think what's right, but I have my own version and beliefs about what's right. When we embrace that as a fundamental truth, a core value of our culture, we just end up in such division. And I guess that's just one example of so many other things happening, sort of a mix of things happening to us. Now, before you sort of feel like that was red meat for people who hate relativism, actually, in some ways, relativism is helpful. For instance, a guy can preach in jeans and a guy can preach in a suit. They can both be right. That's good. We need some relativism. But I guess what I'm saying is when it stands as a core value that even ultimate truth itself or, or the ultimate way to God or knowing God or knowing the way of this universe is something that's just sort of relative, I think we just leave too much division, too much that isn't said, too much that actually becomes not true. 
And I think for us, when we, when we come to the Beatitudes, what we're really realizing is that, like maybe Tim Keller and some others have said, and even some of what I've been thinking over the last few months, is that we, when we follow the way of Christ and follow the way of these Beatitudes, our lives are changing such that we actually, in some cases, our lives and the message we proclaim really is sort of contradictory to, to either of those two ways of thinking. Or to, you know, if, there's, if, if someone, if it's relative, then, then maybe the way of Christ would be sort of contradicting maybe what someone is saying on, on maybe the far right or maybe what someone is saying on the far left of any issue, not just political. And I think what happens here in the Beatitudes is Christ is forming us into the kinds of people who aren't necessarily siding wholeheartedly with either sort of extreme, but finding the way of the good news that speaks to our culture around us. So I'm not saying you can't vote Democrat or Republican. I'm just saying as a Christian, you need to reserve the right to prophetically speak about what's happening in either of our parties. And this happens when I think we set the kingdom of God and his kingship above the the nation of America and some of the, the things that we're dealing with. This is my hope for the Beatitudes, that we would begin to see what country we're from, what way of living we should be living, and what kinds of things we should be believing that free us to be the kinds of people here and now that I think our country needs. I just think that when we talk about peacemaking or when we talk about mourning or those who mourn, we might be surprised at who God sides with. You see, he sides with people born in mangers, the lowly. He sides with people who have to flee persecution and become refugees in Egypt. He sides with all kinds of people that Jesus became, those who are misunderstood, those who are marginalized, those who end up being crucified. This is our Savior, and I think we're going to be surprised when we study who he is. My hope is that our hearts will be open to becoming more like him. There's so much more to say, but let me pray and, and let me ask God to open our hearts, even now, to the work he wants to do in us. Let's pray.